the jittery about that. We're jittery about inflation. We had lumber prices hitting like an all-time high, crushing a home building stock today. You had crude oil near $70. It pulled back a little bit. Aluminum at a seven-year high. Uh, you know, these are things that are generally associated with great economies. Nevertheless, some anxiety about how the Fed will handle this because in the past they have botched it big time. All right. Thank you very, very much, you my friend. Uh, there's so much that could still uh, whips all these markets and, of course, the political world here. The upshot for today, if you're the president of the United States and you're worried about them circling the wagons around you, they might have more trouble keeping the wagons straight around them. The FBI, its reliability, and the principal players involved, including the former number one and number two, are being questioned. I'm Kimberly Guilfoyle, along with Juan Williams, Jesse Waters, Kennedy, and Tyrus. It's 5 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. And some breaking news on the Russian investigation. Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein reportedly telling President Trump just last week that he is not a target of any part of the special counsel's investigation or the investigation into his longtime lawyer, Michael Cohn. This latest development sure to be seen as great news by the president, who just railed against the investigation as a, quote, hoax. There's no collusion. There was no collusion with Russia other than by the Democrats. This was a, uh, really a hoax created largely by the Democrats as a way of uh, softening the blow of a loss. This is a hoax. As far as the investigation, nobody has ever been more transparent than I have. And just moments ago, former FBI Director James Comey weighed in on the news, of course. I don't know what it means. It's a fairly standard part of any investigation, trying to decide whether a person you're encountering is a witness, a subject, or a target. A target is someone on whom the investigation, the grand jury, has developed significant evidence Evidence sufficient to charge, witness is somebody who has nothing to do with any exposure, and a subject is everybody in the middle. So I don't know the context in which the Deputy Attorney General did that, but that's the general framework. All right, almost on another episode of Tonight, Shakespeare in the Park, starring James Comey, pontificating. Mm. All right, so Jesse, yes. he's a, you know, just a thoughtful guy, poetry in motion he is, and wants to weigh in on everything to sell a couple books. Uh, yeah, and he will sell books, but I think uh, his time is up. People are already sick of James Comey, but we're not going to be sick of him when he comes on Fox News in a couple <laughs> weeks. Then we're going to really tune in to Brett Baer, tear him apart. The Trump-Russia investigation has lasted almost two years at this point. This has gone on longer than the 9-11 Commission. They've had multiple people from Team Trump testify in front of the House and the Senate, some of them three to four times. They've turned over over a million documents. They've found no collusion. If there was a smoking gun of collusion, it would have leaked because everything else does. There are no crimes that we have seen so far. So I don't know what they're looking for. You know who hasn't even testified in front of Mueller? Brad Parscal, Trump's own campaign manager, the head of the digital media strategy during the election. He's never even been brought in to be interviewed. So what is Mueller doing? Mueller, I guess they approved this raid on Cohen for a campaign finance violation to right. pay off a porn star. I mean, that's like a fine. Bernie Sanders paid 14 grand for taking money from the Australians. You don't raid some guy's house over a campaign and finance and office, violation. Right. Exactly. So it's totally heavy handed. I think what they're trying to do is flip and squeeze Cohen because they think he might have something based on the dossier. He was the centerpiece of the dossier. They said he was in Prague and he's meeting with this Russian and they're going to cook up some scheme to rig the election. His passport says he's never even been to Prague. So I don't have any idea what they're looking for. And if you look at the collusion, Hillary was the one that paid for fake news mm -hmm. from Russia. She was the one that got that Field into the here. bloodstream of the intelligence community. It was her husband that took a half a billion dollars to speak in Moscow. Not Trump's spouse. It was her foundation that took millions of dollars from the Russians. Not Trump's foundations. So when you look at how it's been treated, the FBI did not go after the DNC server. The FBI did not try to seize Hillary's server. Instead, they try to seize Trump's lawyers' computers. Mm -hmm. And they respected Hillary's attorney-client privilege, and obviously not Trump's attorney-client privilege. Double There's standard, a Jesse. Huge double standard here. Yeah, all right. Jesse, rest his case. Kennedy, <laughs> do, you have, do you concur and, or do you supplement with an amicus brief? Ooh. No, here's, a, here's a, a couple of different things that are happening here. Uh, either this is a way of 
having the president let down his guard and his defenses. Right. So he agrees to talk with the special counsel and cooperate with the investigation so they can ensnare him <clears throat> in some sort of a perjury trap. Sure. And then, you know, we'll push the boundaries and figure out whether or not a sitting president really can be charged with something. Or the investigation is actually winding down and people will find that it's been a big waste of time and money. And I think if, if that truly happens, there will be so much frustration. And it's actually worse for the situation that we're in right now with the FBI and the DOJ because there's been such an erosion of trust. And now if you have politicized bodies, which are supposed to be objective, going after people to bring them down because they're unhappy with the outcome of an election. What does that say about the state of government when you can't even trust an objective source? Sure. Right. I know. So, okay. So, Tyrus, welcome to the program. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> Hi. 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 Oh, man. You know what? When I look at my life and every time I've ever been in trouble with the law, which hasn't been a lot, but when I have and they say, hey, Tyrus, you're not a subject of this investigation, high five, I'm not talking more, may I go? And that's how our president needs to treat this. I'm not a subject of this. Cool, move on. Let's focus on infrastructure. Let's focus on some other stuff. I'm not, it's not me, guys. So whoever they're looking for, enjoy that. But as far as I'm concerned, it's done. He doesn't have to talk to him because he's not a target of the investigation. Don't be lord. So this is like, track, this is a great day. This is a great day. If you told me I'm not a target, I don't have to talk to you anymore, and we can move on. Yeah, so no sour grapes, right? Juan, is that he should just let it go? Well, he's been told that he was not a target before. And he told he wasn't a, yeah, exactly, that he was a subject but not a target. That's what I just said. Yeah. Thank you. I'm wondering if he's still a subject, though. Exactly. I think he is a subject, but I don't know. The point was that he's not a target. Well, a subject as can we turn just into said. one. Yeah, he can instantly turn into a target. So it doesn't have a whole lot of significance in that regard for this investigation. I was so fascinated listening to Jesse. Sometimes I listen to Jesse and I think, Jesse, oh, Jesse is the poet of Trumplandia. <laughs> yes, because you, you capture the president's voice so ably. I'm just he happy you're elegant. actually listening to me, Juan. Of course I listen to you. Because a lot of the you. times it doesn't seem no, like No, no, I listen. I listen He's because like the you're, on like, the you're, you're my music. inside source, brother. <laughs> okay. I listen to you because I want to hear I what the president's thinking. I think you're listening, thinking. but you're not hearing. Oh, no, I hear. But then when I hear, <laughs> sometimes I think, mm, like, gee, I wonder, let's say, Let's say that Paul Manafort's watching The Five. Oh, yeah. how about Michael Flynn? I bet he watches The Five. Yeah. How about George Papadop? You think he watches The Five? Yeah. They wouldn't say that nothing has come of this invest. They'd say, my God, what does that have to do I might with be collusion? going to jail. What does it have to oh, do with collusion? Know. That's the it second thing. It has to do with thing. he has a five that's taste for Persian thing. rugs. Okay. All right, you two. Okay, that's the second thing. You gotta hug it out. You guys need to hug I've been watching this for years. You two need to hug it out. There's some breaking news just in right now from the Washington Post. Former Mayor Rudy Giuliani is saying that he is joining President Trump's legal team in an effort to help negotiate an end to the Mueller probe. And that is just in from uh, the Washington Post. And now, while the president isn't currently a target in the Cohen investigation, he could have some reason to worry still, because according to the Wall Street Journal, one of Mr. Trump's longtime legal advisors just warned him Cohen could turn on the president if he is charged. Kennedy. No, but to, uh, to Juan's point, yeah, there have been some uh, procedural indictments. Yeah. And that just goes to show you, if you cast a big enough net, right. you can grab some fish. But in the end, what does that do for us? Does that make the world a more just place? Does that really hold people accountable? Or does it just show that if you get enough warrants and you go through enough stuff, you can pretty much tag anyone with anything? 100%. No, I you think You see that, that in grand juries. It's a great point from a legal perspective. They just toss everything up against the wall. Well, I mean, I just don't see it, Kennedy. And I, I, I mean, go back to what Jesse was talking about in this most recent case where it's portrayed, oh, the feds knocked down Michael Cohen's door to get these documents. How, they're unofficial. Guess what? You know, several layers of government officials and judges, most of them Republicans, had to approve of this. It was a legitimate execution of a warrant. And so you have to keep that in mind. But getting back to Cohen today, the big news on Cohen is, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, BuzzFeed. I'm sorry that I was threatening to sue you. Oh, I'm sorry, Fusion GPS. I'm not suing you either. We don't want any trouble with you, says Cohen. I, yeah, maybe Cohen's attitude is changing. You know why his attitude's changing? Because yeah. he's probably looking at his bank account. His and he realizes that he's not going to be able to afford this lawsuit mind. against BuzzFeed because it's going to cost him an arm and a leg, and he's probably up to here in legal defense bills on being raided. Mm -hmm. So well, I think it's more of a monetary issue, less of a, a factual issue. And on the Rosenstein's thing, Rosenstein was the one that did approve the raid. He's conflicted. 
I mean, he was the one that wrote the memo saying why Comey should be fired. And then he uh -huh. went to go. And now he is overseeing investigation into whether Trump broke the law in firing Comey. Okay, so well, how, is that, how is that a conflict? You don't see that as a conflict? And he was the one that signed off on the warrants to surveil the Trump He's campaign. He's the deputy attorney general. That's his job. Right. right. And then he broke like the law because he perpetrated Yeah, there's like 147. Everyone keeps talking about the advice he was given to by his attorney. Yeah. Again, not that I've ever done anything wrong, but <laughs> if I've ever had advice from an attorney, it was great advice. It had nothing to do with, with Cohen's character. He was telling him, as a lawyer, these are things you need to be aware of. Right. Don't tell one, you and I are tight. If you get indicted, I'm not going to call you. <laughs> oh, no man. matter what, I'm just not going to do it. What and he's telling him, don't talk to him. Don't <laughs> talk to him. Oh, well, you could flip. You could do all these but other things, but that doesn't mean there's anything there. He's right. attorney. He's done things that he's supposed to do as an attorney. Not all of it pretty. Some of it ugly. That was his job. That's the things he took on, the responsibilities that come with that, yeah. and the penalties from that. He's a fixer. I was a fixer for Snoop. I did things. I never told him what I did. It just is the problem over. Yes, right. it is. Is Giuliani <laughs> the fixer akin to your Giuliani fixer situation? Giuliani is a crazy this dog? pit bull who I would want him on my side. Yeah, like, Kenny, what do you great, think about this, Juli this breaking news about Giuliani being added to the team? I, it actually, it, it doesn't surprise me. And this is probably a, a better place for him than being attorney general or having some other formal post in the administration because he is very loyal to the president. He knows the law well. He's been a U.S. attorney. And he knows how to combat a lot of this stuff from the inside out. But he's also a politician. And he is a fighter. And, you know, he, he has remained loyal to the president even though he wasn't given one of the plums post that many thought he was going to after President Trump's election. And I think they were a little worried about him going through the nomination process because some of the things that might have come out, but now he doesn't have to go through that process. And I liked how they've couched this is that they're negotiating the winding down of this deal because how many months have we heard that this thing is going to end? I mean, every other month it's like we're winding down, we're winding down. Hopefully this is going to be an indication that perhaps they are negotiating a winding down of this investigation. Well, I think part of the story today is that Trump can't get most of the top-notch conservative lawyers in America to come work for him. And so he's asked, he's talking to How his How dare friends. you besmirch Jay Sekulow? <laughs> Jay Sekulow is working for him. I know, I mean, I'm saying. Uh, Jay has lots of ties to lots of people in, beyond Donald Trump. But uh -huh. here's the thing. So you get... Rudy Giuliani, and Rudy Giuliani, by the way, in addition to being former mayor of New York, was a former prosecutor, very Correct. successful prosecutor, so he has some insight there. He's been out of the game for a while. That's not to the president's advantage. But you notice the president was calling a lot of his former lawyers. Just last week, the Wall Street Journal today reports one of those former lawyers told him, go ahead, fire some of these guys, get rid of Rosenstein, don't be bashful, definitely don't talk to the investigators. So I think he's reaching out to the old gang because he can't get the best of current criminal I lawyers. I think that's to totally, totally a false statement, Go erroneous. Ahead. Yeah, uh, honestly, because he can get who he wants and who he needs. He listens to a variety of different opinions, and Rudy Giuliani is very well respected. I would not say in any way, oh, he's out of the game and not going to give the president. He still wields a tremendous amount of influence. He was an outstanding prosecutor. Take it from one, and I think that he's actually going to be a very well reasoned, measured addition to the president's team, especially at this juncture. You bring in specialists at certain points and different phases, and just because these people are saying that they are winding the investigation down doesn't mean that they, and they didn't get a smoking gun, that they're still not going to try and go after the president. He's, like but the he's Democrats. also a former prosecutor and a politician, and, and knowing the law and politics, Absolutely. I think it's really critical because so much of this, and, and you know, a lot of the perception going into the midterms and 2020 hinges on this and the outcome of of it. And that's why it's really important to have someone who can do both things ably. Plus, Very Trump is a loose cannon. As, as a lawyer, to, to tell him what to do, you're going to tell the president, our president, what to do? So chances are he has to refer to guys who have told him what to do in the past and can have that conversation. But as a client, he's very difficult because you'll say, listen, we're not going to talk about anything. And then he'll go out and tweet and say what's on his mind. Someone will say something wrong. So a lot of attorneys don't want that headache because they cannot rein him in where Giuliani and him have a relationship. Maybe guys from his, guys who's worked for him in the past, yeah. they know how to deal with him. So I guess more of that opposed to why wouldn't you not want to be on the front end of a fight for America? And Americans? sometimes I mean, you go back to your roots, yeah. right? You, you go, go old school. You have to. Because <laughs> he's old school. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what's I hear you. That's why John Dowd's no longer there. He won't listen to Yeah. Okay. He's like, peace, John Dowd. All right, ahead. Should Hillary Clinton be worried that the DOJ's inspector general is now recommending criminal charges against Andrew McCabe? We have all the details next.
Nearly a dozen House Republicans have sent a criminal referral to the Justice Department pushing for criminal prosecutions of former Obama officials like Jim Comey, Hillary Clinton, and FBI lovebirds Peter Strzok and Lisa Page. They argue, quote, those in positions of high authority should be treated the same as every other American. Comey brushed off the claims on The View yesterday. I haven't read it. I don't know what to make of it. it seems they've been saying that stuff since the Clinton email investigation. A whole lot of that's already being looked at by the Inspector General of the Department of Justice, which is a very good thing. And I don't have any other reaction. Okay. I, uh, the accusations right. are not true. I, sh I guess I should have said that first, yeah. but, right. but that's okay. Judge Knapp is also calling on the Attorney General to take action against Hillary. The evidence of Mrs. Clinton's guilt of espionage, failure to safeguard state secrets, that's the 22 or 23 top secret pieces of information that were on her private server. This is a big deal. The failure to do that, the evidence of guilt is overwhelming. There's evidence of serious felonies in her part. She shouldn't be immune from prosecution because she ran for president and lost or because her last name is Clinton. While we don't know if the DOJ will move on that, we did learn today that the department's inspector general did recommend criminal charges for fired FBI official Andrew McCabe. McCabe's team just responding, saying they are confident the U.S. Attorney's Office will decline to prosecute. So, Kimberly, Judge Knapp, lock her up. <laughs> Chant, uh, on, I think, was it Fox and Friends? Who knows? But he's pointing to, I guess, gathering yeah, and, tra and transmitting uh -huh. information relating to the national defense, not securing it. I mean, that's a 10 year stint right there. Yeah, that's he, serious. He's not business. wrong about the law and the penalty, of course, but it's where, whether or not there's going to be the wherewithal uh, and the intention, the motivation to be able to follow through on those charges and pursue them. So it, it's interesting because there's been so much that we've had to discuss and go through with this, but that is something that was sort of people thought was going to come back like the ghost of Christmas past. Like, okay, let's take a look at this again. Were these properly maintained, these classified materials? Was there a breach? If so, was this intentional? Um, is this something that she should be? Be, you know, investigated for, prosecuted for, etc. So, and now we see the decision with respect to McCabe and saying that perhaps the, the DOJ, they're not going to pursue it. Right. So, with respect to McCabe, Juan, I mean, if you're going to do things by the book, he lied four times, three times under oath. Technically, he could be prosecuted for that. That's what you're saying. And how do you feel about that? Liar and a leaker. Andrew McCabe. I don't know that he's a liar and a leaker. Well, he lied course. about leaking. So what yes, I know is. is that the inspector general says that he found him to have lied, and he yes. believes that he lied about something of substance, which is, by the way, just for the viewers so they know, this is about a Wall Street Journal article about a probe into the Clinton Foundation. And it's interesting because McCabe was making the case that despite objections from higher level Justice Department officials, the FBI should be allowed to pursue an investigation into the Clinton Foundation. And that's what he was saying to the reporter. Now, apparently, Comey, who ordered this investigation, and he are at odds, and the Inspector General says that McCabe is the one that was lying. So I don't know, but yes, refer it. Let's see what happens. But we don't know for sure uh, that anybody is doing anything that favored Hillary Clinton versus Donald. To the contrary, what we're seeing is McCabe was saying, I want to investigate Clinton. Right. Um, also to come out, you're right, of that was that the person he had do the leaking was Lisa Page, the FBI agent that, remember, was texting uh, Peter Strzok and they were talking about in Andrew McCabe's office uh, an insurance policy to protect against a Trump presidency. And now she, as long as Peter Strzok, are in the crosshairs of this criminal referral as well. Yeah, there are so many vectors here, and they all point to unholy hell. <laughs> and every time James Comey opens his mouth, Hillary Clinton has to be pulling her hair out because he is illustrating these contradictions, yeah, contra yeah. the contradictory statements that he has made under oath. And he's also, you know, for example, Andrew McCabe, according to James Comey, is a good person, and good people lie. However, the president is a bad person and morally unfit because the president lies. So James Comey can't have it both ways, and that is the least of his concerns. What's really interesting is, you know, he's obviously not a man with 
stones. And he's <laughs> terrified to come out and make any straightforward statements. Right. But he'll sort of dance around an issue, and he has thrown Loretta Lynch under the bus. Mm -hmm. And he has said that there is some classified information about Loretta Lynch that he can't talk about, mm -hmm. but what he's implying is that it has to do with Hillary Clinton's campaign and the DNC. And you have to wonder if they put pressure on Loretta Lynch to shut down this Clinton Foundation investigation, which Andrew McCabe didn't want to do, and he felt he had to CYA, so he went to the Wall Street Journal to sort of clear his own name, mm -hmm. panicked and lied about it, and now here we are in an even deeper quagmire. <laughs> A deeper swamp, Tyrus. What do you think? Oh. I'm, I'm glad I'm tall. Swamp. This, man, Where's this Roy? Is a, <laughs> this is an ugly, ugly time to, for the FBI. I mean, it's just shameful. And I, I'm one of the people that were... I don't want to hear the Hillary Clinton name anymore. I don't, I don't want it, I want it to go into Mitt Romneyville. I want it to just go away. <laughs> and he'll come back another thing. It's and as far as, hey, he's back, but he's back. There's been enough time to where we forgot. But this whole thing with with her investigation, it was so sloppy. And the story has now become the FBI and the lying and the covering up. So it's almost, you almost have to have the special counsel look into the whole thing because there's so many parts to it now. I want it to go away. I didn't want to see her investigate. He lost. I, I wanted to go away. He, every time I hear her name, I'm like, just let's move on. Yeah, we'll cut a but, deal. You guys drop the Trump stuff. We'll oh, drop the Hillary stuff. Here and then we, we can go. move on to the midterms. As, as in, oh, gee, <laughs> she's the president. She deserves all that. No, somebody else is president. Who's that, Jesse? Oh, yeah, he Donald should be investigated. Donald J. Trump. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you so eight years, Juan. Eight just, years. Just, just besmirch the FBI. Go after CIA. They all besmirch of them. themselves. All of them. Everyone's been has, fired and demoted. Has you ever heard the FBI so much to where we know who the FBI is as has been now? Like you didn't used to hear about them all the time. They weren't the they weren't the story. And that's my problem with this whole thing is Comey and them are the story. He wants and to they make should, himself. And they shouldn't. And that's shameful. Right. That's yeah. not what the that's not what the office is. I think is. this is Trump's team going after them so to undercut the Mueller investigation. Did Trump's well, team write the book Higher Loyalty that blah yeah. blah blah about James Comey? Who fired Comey? Trump didn't. Oh, I Either one right. of them would have fired Comey. Hillary would have fired, fired him, fired him so. even yeah, faster. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, they were in captivity, but now dozens of dangerous gang members are prowling the streets again thanks to America's defiant sanctuary cities and states. The outrage coming up. Welcome back. The Trump administration waging a war against jurisdictions that provide sanctuary to illegal immigrants. Now they've released some statistics to support that concern. More than 100 suspected members of MS-13 and other gangs were released in sanctuary cities and areas generally last year, and that came despite requests from the federal government that they be held. This is a breakdown by state. Two-thirds of those releases occurred in California. President Trump said on Twitter today, California's dangerous policies of releasing violent criminals puts all Americans at risk. He also thanked San Diego County for backing the administration's lawsuit against the state. Kimberly, what do you make of it, my California friend? California, friend, I know. We seem to always go uh, back and forth here on this. Um, yeah, it's really gotten to be pretty accelerated and out of control in California. And, you know, I remember the good old days when I was back there when I was first lady in San Francisco. Seems it's like it was just much more sane at the time. <laughs> but now you have such a big, aggressive push. You have backlash from certain counties. They're saying, wait a second, don't lump us all into this. We want to follow the law. We want to uphold the law. We want fairness. And we're actually seeking justice not injustice. We want people to come into this country legally. We welcome with open arms, okay? And that's, that's how it should be. When you see the, the law broken and people coming in and essentially back and forth revolving doors, that's not helping the immigrant, illegal immigrants coming in, their families, the children, the people get separated. It's not helping the local law enforcement and ordinances and the border. It's just fraught with complications and problems. And this is an issue that President Trump is not going to give up on, but it also seems that, you know, Governor Brown is digging in, Lieutenant Governor, do some digging in, and this is really becoming a very large political issue for the upcoming uh, gubernatorial election. Okay, so Jesse, help me out here just for a second so the audience understands what's at stake. The sanctuary cities legislation says basically if you have 
your average illegal immigrant in jail, they get out of jail, the, the, the city or the state has no obligation to notify the feds. But if it's a violent criminal, they will let you know. And then, of course, if there's a detainer or a warrant, they definitely are obligated to let you know. It's a, if it's a felony beef right. that they're holding them on, it gives the locals discretion to contact the feds. Correct. It doesn't mandate it, but there's also other elements. So if you pull over a guy for running a red light, and he's got tattoos all over his face, no ID, can't speak English, you can't even ask him about his citizenship. And they restrict ICE access to prisons, and you can't hold an illegal immigrant longer than you would otherwise while you wait for the feds to slap so the what is what does the president want so the president wants these sanctuary cities defunded and he wait, wants that, that, ICE they would, that they would even with someone who wasn't criminal or, or a violent criminal that they would hold them and, and, and tell the feds come get them. I think they prioritize it if it's someone that's not here in this country illegally and it's just like a small thing maybe shoplifting or something tiny obviously the feds are going to prioritize it because they're busy but if someone punches you in the face steals a car is selling narcotics something big then the president wants ICE to be able to there and go in there and get those guys and then ship them out. All Bad right. hombres. So, Kennedy, what the numbers show coming from the president the White House today is we have 37 jurisdictions that have been engaging in this kind of behavior. Obviously, California, two-thirds of these numbers. But, you know, states like Washington, Washington State, also involved all over the country. What do you think? Uh, if, if, the, if that's how the states want to play it, that's fine. And if, if they want to operate independently, I don't have a problem with that. I also uh, think, you know, I happen to have a very high opinion of most immigrants who come to this country because most of them don't commit crimes and they work very hard. And I hate to see them lumped in with members of MS-13. Uh, the problem is if you're letting bad people go and enter into society and hurt people, uh, they get really good at not getting arrested and committing and continuing to commit crimes and that's not okay and, and you end up having a, a disingenuous conversation about immigration and about crime and unfortunately immigrants get tarred as all being really bad people who want to hurt you and take your stuff and by and large that is just vastly not the case and I also don't like that I, I love California I like Kimberly I love it it's a great state and I hate to see it torn apart I hate to see the state turned into you're either on our team or you're not you're Absolutely. us or them you're for us or against us and that means that we have bad immigration policy from the top that is too confusing for states and counties it's very it's very polarizing you make a great point and the and the problem is is that you see this injustice because so many hard-working uh, men and women and children that grow up then in this country from fantastic immigrant backgrounds like my families and contribute to society want to do it the right way so it's unfair when we have to stigmatize it but this is just the lawlessness cannot be ignored when you see people like MS-13 who I had to prosecute you know when I was a, a DA in San Francisco and Los Angeles I mean the horrific crimes that are committed they should not be allowed to come in and re-enter again right. public so, safety Ty issue Tyrus I don't think he was talking about you with the tattoos <laughs> I got tattoos, but uh, you know I was born in Massachusetts, so I'm good. But I grew up in, in California, and I don't see the upside of the argument. Like I, I always try to look at things down the middle. Right. And if you if you're here illegally, you're already breaking the law. Right. And if you do something violent, you should be held up. You should be held up. If you rob, you steal, you do things. If it was a normal American citizen and he had a warrant in a different place, they're going to hold it. Right. So I hooked. think it's only fair. And you're the worst thing is is they're encouraging. The gang, they're encouraging gang members to bring more guys over because the worst thing will happen right. is you'll do something and then they'll let you go and they you come back. They know California. They know the laws better like than the people who are arresting them. Best believe that. These aren't. This isn't dumb. These aren't dumb. Don't ever think that these gangs are dumb. They're not. They know the system better than the system. So they'll just keep coming as long as there's not a deterrent. If there's a deterrent, they'll, they'll stop. I think what you said is true. I just worry that we are demonizing people who are hard And it's not fair. Immigrants. It's not fair for someone who came in the right way. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Another liberal governor goes on a tear about President Trump and, and Trump supporters. That's straight ahead. Dance party. Yesterday, New York's far-left Governor Andrew Cuomo bypassed his state's legislature and restored voting rights to tens of thousands of felons. But he tore into the Trump administration for being undemocratic at Al Sharpton's annual convention. Watch. They want to take what they believe and impose it on you. And that's not just anti-democratic, that is anti-American, my friends. 
And this administration is repugnant to all the values Dr. King spoke about. It's anti-immigrant, it's anti-woman, anti-gun safety, anti-equality, anti-environment, anti-inclusion. It is anti-everything. Especially anti-logic. He also took a dig at Trump voters. I don't believe Mr. Trump won the election. I believe we lost the election. I don't believe anyone ran into the voting booth saying, I can't wait to vote for Mr. Trump. Boy, I feel good about this. Seem like that. Yeah, why, he, he seems to be speaking in a very affected tone. What was Jesse, that? what was he saying there? I couldn't quite grasp it. Is he a fan of the president? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think what he's trying to do is he's going to get outflanked by Cynthia Nixon, the sex and the city woman. And so he has to go hard left. And he's going to try to be the anti-Trump crusader because he doesn't want to attack the sex in the city person because she's so likable. She's a celebrity outsider. She's female. She's fun. She's interesting. She's new. And it's a better strategy just to go hard against the president. And just to be fair here, I don't know of any sitting Republican governor that ever called Barack Obama anti-American. I mean, if they, ha if they did, I think the media would just rain hell upon that person until they were out of office. The fact that he can get away with saying that just shows how corrupt the media is. Well, Andrew Cuomo perhaps has some interesting ideas, Juan, about criminal justice reform, but is granting felons the right to vote through his executive order the right way to do it? Uh, no, I mean, obviously the right way to do it is to go through the state legislature, but the problem, Kennedy, is that it's Republican dominated in the Senate and they have refused to act on this. So what he's doing that's is... That's not a problem. What? Nothing. He so, said that's the problem. Well, that's the problem in terms of what I'm yeah. describing to Kennedy. So what he's doing is simply saying, uh, I'm looking for people who have parole. It's not that they are still. And then people who are on parole would be given the right to vote. Do you think that's... I think that's fine. I mean, as long as they're not, for instance, being given the right to serve on juries... Um, but the idea is that people should be stakeholders in our society. Yeah. And I don't think that for all time you have to have your voting rights removed if you've been paroled. Now, is this just, is this sort of like the sanctuary city policy where you're reaching out to giant groups of voters, uh, saying to them, if I give you a grab bag, you'll vote with my party for life? I think you're right. I'm still stuck on the, that voice. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm a little bit offended. He was at the Al Sharpton, yeah. and he was talking like this, huh, and we anti that. and we can, I'm like, why are you talking that way? I mean, I have friends in college who used to do that. You don't have to talk that way. We're cool, bro. We're friends. <laughs> you don't have to be, you, you know, and he yeah. was literally just, and, uh, huh, and I'm like, I'm sure someone's like, bro, we appreciate it, but you don't need to talk that way. It's fine. It was like we get the Billy message Billy without the like, extra know. soul to put in there. It was a little, slow, little offensive. Slow little offensive. Down, I'm anti his his conversation. Slow it down, bro. Yeah, slow it down. Speaking of which, he did have a little soul glow in. Maybe yeah, even did. like roll it back. Because it, was, it was a little bit over the top. I was like, Is it a winning strategy for him now? Uh, well, it wasn't a winning tone. And I think it just seemed to me that somebody wants to run for president. Oh. That it's not just about governor. But it's about running for president, and he's taking a strong stance to try to, like, poke the cage for anybody who's okay, anybody out there who is anti-Trump or, you know, that inflammatory rhetoric to try to stir up the base and get them for him. And again, it's true, because Cynthia Nixon is running, so he's going to try to tack even further left. That's a little bit of a squeeze play with, you know, her addition into the race. And now he's like, okay, now what am I going to do? What am I going to do? i got to go this way a little bit. Until he has to run that yep. way a little no, bit. No, I think you're absolutely right. He's, he's looking past the State House and right to the White House. Ooh, Ooh, President Cuomo. What a ring. All right, America, could you go an entire day without dropping a swear word? <laughs> Tyrus is shaking his head now. <laughs> the survey is in, and it is a big bleeping no. We'll discuss next. <laughs> getting my Greg on. If you've already dropped a few F-bombs today or another swear word of choice, you have plenty of potty mouth company. 25% of Americans reveal that they can't get past breakfast without cursing. Most days, most others have let one rip by 11 a.m., according to a new survey. But that just means you're smart. According to another study, intelligent people are more likely to cuss. In that case, I'm the bleeping genius. Yeah. <laughs> I'll cuss all day. Juan, are you a cusser? Uh, I try not to. I mean, it happens. It's just in casual Yes or no? Well, yes, then.
Burley? That was a very effective interrogation. <laughs> Terrible. Yes or no? I should treat Juan like that. Yes or no? Yeah, you do sometimes. Have you ever heard Juan be so brief? He was like, Well, it's the truth. It's the truth. Good for you. That's funny. Are you a customer? Uh, yeah. Yep. Former prosecutor and, you know, plenty of time with detectives, police officers, gang unit, homicide unit, death penalty team. I was like, you read enough of these police reports? But yes, I have read that study, by the way. It's, I find it interesting. Yeah. But you we, know, the number we try one not reason. To, but, you know. The number one reason, though, isn't like, you know, you're dealing with tough people. It's that you have financial problems. No, I see. Oh, I find it for me. I lose my car keys. It's it's game on. I'll it's I lose like a stress it. Bump my head, stub my toe. I mean, the list talks about home life, family, financials. Water. You do not strike me as a guy who cusses a lot. I believe you find other words He's like, like the least Jimmy stressed Christmas person or ever. Golly G. Willikers kind of. Thing. <laughs> I have a very refined background. Yeah, I believe that. Very <laughs> My mother would wash my mouth out with soap if I cursed. So, yes, Jiminy Crickets has uh, escaped my lips on a number of occasions when oh. I lose things. Wow. Or when Juan Jesse. makes me very angry. Oh. But, um, you know, if I do curse, I put a little dime in the bucket, and that's about it. That's, that's amazing. I'm not even going to ask this one because I know. Yeah, come on, man. It, it, the epitaph is like a tapestry of just artful words. If there, if there is not a curse word on my tombstone, I have failed. <laughs> Growing up, we had a swear court, which was an unfinished foundation of a building with a bunch of swear words written on it. And so my brothers and our neighborhood friends and I would go into the swear court and we would swear. Swear court? Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> it was like a safe place for swearing. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. It was our safe space. Yes. But I thought, she has I colorful thought, language, but the kindest heart. Oh, but, but, yeah. Yeah. I, thought, safe space. I thought ladies weren't supposed to do that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't ask oh. that question. Oh, I can't oh, do that. Oh, it's the Me Too oh, movement. Are you out of your bleeping mind? You can't do that. Almost got through because a whole show. I thought on. so much of Kennedy. These you know? are outdated gender stereotypes, Will. Yeah, so okay. bad. Okay. Shame Shame on you. Oh no! Shame I got crushed. Oh no! Mom, send a nice text. Just Twitter's gonna let you have it. Oh boy, here I go. That wouldn't be a new oh, thing. <laughs> yeah, you leave. Yeah, you leave him alone. He's a good man. There you go. Oh, it's. Oh, one more thing's up next. <laughs> now for one more thing and also Kimberly's food court. Oh yes. Yay! The buffet. We love it. The banquet hall. Okay, so the verdict is in. I knew if I waited long enough that somebody would come up with a study that would tell me that pasta is not bad for you, that eating all these carbs is actually quite fantastic. So it's no longer the bad guy. Okay, Tyrus, pasta is back in. A new study says that you don't have to avoid pasta if you want to lose weight. So researchers found that uh, people who lost more weight on a low glycemic diet with pasta. Kenny will explain that later. And that pasta itself did not cause weight gain or an increase in body fat. I think if you ate a lot of it, it might be a problem. Well, this doesn't mean that, yes, you can drown yourself in penne or, as Jesse is doing right now, spaghetti mm. and meatballs. But it's great news because I love spaghetti and meatballs. It's one of my favorites. And I'm sorry we'll get uh, gluten-free for Sweetheart Kennedy next. And you don't want any one? Okay. No, I got mine. Juan. <laughs> All right. So OMT. Damien Schrader got a surprise in the mail the other day summons for jury duty. So why is that a surprise, you ask? Take a look at Damien. That's right. He's four years old. Uh, previously, Damien only got one letter in the mail. That was from Santa Claus. Anyway, his mom took him down to the Luzerne County Courthouse this week for jury duty. He was excused because he had to go to preschool. <laughs> Damien's folks think he ended up on the jury list because tax documents filed by his family after they bought him some stocks. But who knows? Maybe we need four-year-old jurors. I think we do. That sometimes they might be quite more sensible than the adults in the box. Jesse. Okay. Uh, so yesterday we did a segment about, you know, when parents have kids, whether they should actually say they have a favorite child. I weighed in and I said, obviously, I felt that I was the favorite child, you know? Naturally. My father weighed in, so now we have dad texts. This is what he said. Oh, my. We took turns, so both of you felt the spotlight. Well, you were the firstborn, and that by itself carries a lot of weight. Then you were the star at so many things, 
And then you push the limits. And Eliza decided to seek and get the positive attention. And then mom and I realized so many parts of you and Eliza were our parts too. We now can brag about each of you equally. Oh, Isn't that nice? Bad should, text. They should write a parenting book, I just decided. Right. And like base it on the themes mom and dad text and so sweet. But I love how yes. you took particular emphasis. How to on raise words. a Fox News host. Dog. Man, having like a that. dad sounds cool. <laughs> I got one of those. Oh That's my cool. gosh. Cool. Man, Listen, wow. I think you've turned out so well. Yeah, but I would have liked a dad text. I'd have been okay, cool. I'll send you. But then I'd be like, who's this? So I'd have been, yeah, never mind. Go ahead. Okay, Kennedy. Uh, this one I know will, will ring in your heart, and it is bittersweet. The last of Queen Elizabeth's corgis mm. has passed. Aww. Willow was 14 years old. She was suffering from cancer and was put down in the palace. Uh, the palace has yet to release an official statement, but the queen fell in love with her corgi, Susan, when she was 18 years old. It was a gift in 1944. She took Susan with her on her uh, hot, hot honeymoon with Prince Philip when they married. That's how attached she was to dog. And oh, Susan's bloodline has lived on through these corgis with the queen, but the queen decided Decided a few years ago that she was going to stop breeding her dogs, and the last of Susan's line oh. has fallen into that's, eternal puppy slumber. That's actually really sad. That's like, it is sad. And, and dog, dog news meets And the, the, uh, the queen is so deeply associated with those dogs, so it is Thank the you. end of an era for them. My, my series on the Crown was, I saw the dogs. I loved them. So, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, Waters, I watched the